Thank you for joining us today for the Reproductive Freedom Caucus press conference. I'm State Representative Kali Vang Her, the House Co-Chair of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus with Senator Lindsay Port. I represent District 64A here in St. Paul. Last year, around this time, we stood as a caucus with an agenda to protect reproductive freedom and bodily autonomy. It was the 50th anniversary of Roe and the Supreme Court had recently overturned the decision that we were told was as good as law. In 2023, we passed the PRO Act, the Reproductive Freedom Codification Bill, and the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act. We also supported our Queer Caucus to establish Minnesota as a trans refuge state. Together, we systematically dismantled barriers anti-abortionist extremists and politicians have been building for five decades to limit Minnesotans' reproductive health care options. The right and ability of everyone in Minnesota to get abortion care and other essential reproductive services stand stronger and better protected than they have in decades. We have made possible a brighter, fairer, safer, and more equitable future for full spectrum reproductive health care in Minnesota. But our work is not yet done. We envision a future for Minnesota in which everyone, without exception, can shape and realize their reproductive future and destiny for themselves and with support and empowerment of the government, but without its interference. We believe every person has the right to have or not have children and to build the families and raise the children they do have in safe, sustainable, thriving communities. We support those laws, policies, and programs that seek to increase access to full spectrum of reproductive health care and its affordability and oppose all efforts to restrict people's choices and ability to get the care that they need. Our successes last session is the roadmap for the future. The RFC acted with unity and strength last session and accomplished what Minnesotans asked for. We did not allow scarcity and fear to determine our actions. We accomplished amazing progress because we chose to be guided by abundance and power. Today, we welcome the opportunity to share our Reproductive Freedom Caucus priorities for the 2024 session. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Finke. I represent District 66 Her. I use she, her pronouns. I'm here today to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment, the most inclusive, expansive equal rights amendment that has been introduced in the country. I am very excited and honored and grateful to the Reproductive Freedom Caucus for understanding that reproductive freedom is trans liberation and that these, this work cannot exist separately. It is a Venn diagram that is actually a circle. This ERA will codify the rights, not codify, constitutionally protect the rights of women, the right to reproductive freedom, the right to gender affirming care, and the rights of intersex individuals. It will be comprehensive, inclusive, and declare Minnesota as a place that all communities will have the respect they deserve and the rights that they demand. Um, this is particularly important at this moment in the American trans community. Um, we suffered a great, great tragedy recently, uh, a reminder of what it is to be trans in this country and what it means for us to take a stand on behalf of a community that is desperate for protection. So I want to make sure that we understand not just how important this ERA is, which it is, and not just how long fought this has been and how much work our ERA advocates have done over the decades to pass this, but how important it is that we see the changing reality of American political life and communal life and protect everyone together at last. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, apologies for my voice. I, I have three kids. I'm always telling them to share. I meant with each other, not their colds with me. Um, <laughs> I'm Dr. Angela Cade Gepford. I use they, them pronouns. I am a pediatrician, the chief medical officer, and the medical director of the Gender Health Program at Children's Minnesota, where our team is committed to providing essential health care to transgender and gender diverse youth. I want to thank the Reproductive Freedom Caucus for elevating the need to talk about this critical care today. At its core, this evidence based health care is listening to and supporting transgender youth and their families, providing them developmentally appropriate mental health and medical care. This care is not new. This care is not experimental. This care is age appropriate and provided with parental consent. And perhaps most importantly, this care improves 
the health and the outcomes for the families and the youth that we serve. There are dozens of studies showing that when young people have access to this essential care, it reduces depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide, and more than that, it improves their sense of self and it improves the way that they see themselves thriving in the world. The passage of the trans refuge law last year sent a clear message that Minnesota is a safe place for transgender and gender diverse youth to receive this life-saving care. And that message was received. After the law was passed, a PFUND survey found that 150 plus individuals and families were moving to Minnesota to seek refuge. Last year, our gender health clinic at Children's Minnesota saw a 30% increase in new patient calls as states around us began to restrict and ban access to care. And while moving to Minnesota or traveling here is certainly a hardship for patients and families, they're hopeful that we'll be ready to welcome them with open arms and help them get the care that they need. Unfortunately, our arms are already incredibly full. Prior to the passage of the Trans Refuge Bill, our waiting list was over a year long, and we have watched it grow. Our team at Children's Minnesota and our colleagues in the Twin Cities who specialize in this essential health care are outmatched by the demand. The Trans Refuge Law was an important first step in protecting essential health care for transgender and gender diverse youth. It's now vital that we take the second step to improve access to this care. To improve access, we're calling on Minnesota lawmakers to invest in the infrastructure we need to provide specialized training for more providers who can approach this care according to well-established guidelines. Specifically, we're asking for investment in a grant-funded training program that would expand access to essential health care for trans and gender diverse youth by leveraging the expertise and care systems already in place. As Representative Finke said, we live in a country where far too many transgender youth are harassed and scared to show up as their authentic selves in their daily lives. We live in a country where a 16-year-old non-binary student was attacked in their school bathroom earlier this month and died from their injuries. The last thing trans kids need is to feel that their government is attacking them as well. I'm proud of the state of Minnesota for acknowledging that all young people deserve to be their authentic and wonderful selves and for protecting their legal right to access the essential health care they deserve. But it's time for us to take the next step. It's time to make good on our promise to have room in our arms to embrace the families that need us. It's time to make sure that transgender and gender diverse young people get to move beyond survival and step into the beauty and the joy of fully thriving as the gifts that they are to their families and the gifts that they are to us in the great state of Minnesota. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Esther Agbaje, and I represent House District 59B in Minneapolis. And I'm also here along with the Reproductive Freedom Caucus, as well as the Black Maternal Health Caucus in the Minnesota House. I want to highlight the importance of this work on increasing positive outcomes for Black maternal health care. Unfortunately, the way Black women are treated related to their reproductive health care and options leaves much to be desired. These disparities are linked to systemic racism and implicit bias, which contribute to higher maternal mortality rates among black women. Black women are three times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy-related complications and face barriers to accessing quality postnatal care. Black birthing people are also more likely to experience life-threatening conditions like preeclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, and blood clots, as well as in incidences of other pregnancy-related complications like preterm birth and low birth weight. The history of racism has also prevented black women from having the families that they want, when they want them, and how they want them. One of our goals is to expand midwifery access to ensure that black birthing people can have the birthing experience that they deserve. We know that this additional option can lead to increased survival rates, especially when it's done with a culturally competent professional who could be more likely to pay attention to the needs of black mothers and their babies. We will also be advocating for more data and research about morbidity and, more, and maternal health studies to improve pregnancy outcomes. Finally, we know that beyond the birthing experience, parents, especially parents of color, can sometimes be unnecessarily scrutinized when facing issues of poverty when trying to raise their families. 
We will continue to advocate for family preservation to ensure that as long as there is no imminent danger facing a child, there are more opportunities for resources for parents to maintain their families rather than defaulting to breaking families apart. Maintaining healthy families requires the reproductive justice policies we are pursuing through the RFC, as well as other issues like dignified and safe housing, housing access to nutritious food, education opportunities, and a healthy environment free from water, air, and soil pollution. We will be purposeful this year to ensure that reproductive health care access is just and equitable, not only for those with means and privilege, but for any person seeking to have and support a family. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Polston, and I am a midwife. I am a community midwife with Roots Community Birth Center. And I want to start by thanking the Reproductive Freedom Caucus for including midwives in this consideration. Um, it's not transformative if it's not intersectional, and intersectional care includes pregnancy care. Um, as Representative Ogbaje talked about, the experiences of our community are dire. They're extreme, and I want you to think of three numbers as I share with you. I want you to think of 13, 23, and 16. Right now, 13% of the birthing people in Minnesota are African American. Of the maternal mortalities that we experience in our state, 23% are African American. We represent a disproportionate share of the women and birthing people who die during pregnancy and related to pregnancy outcomes. Legislation that supports expanding midwifery, midwifery care, midwifery access within the community makes it so that we have more opportunities to provide care and prevent the very disparities that we're talking about. I also want to talk about the number 16. That is how many black midwives there are in the state of Minnesota. And I'm one of them. When I opened Roots in 2015, there were six of us. We have done, we've identified the need to create more midwives so that we can actually address these issues. I'll give you another number, and that's eight. Roots Community Birth Center as a community birth center located on the north side is one of only eight black-owned or led birth centers in the country. We have the ability, we have the tools, we know how to address the issues. We just need more support to do that, and part of that comes from growing a workforce. I'd love for you all to uh, support the house file to support community, uh, certified midwives as we join as we expand them into Minnesota and hopefully address some of these issues. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am a Senator and Lee Mann. I represent Senate District 50, which includes Edina and Bloomington. First, I would like to perhaps reiterate why we, and specifically I, am here today. Um, I, as a practicing physician, among many other things, uh, believe that no one should die of HIV or AIDS. I believe in access to mental health care. I believe that childbirth should be safe for all people. I believe in access to reproductive health care. And of course, I believe that reproductive health care is essential health care. It's because of those beliefs that uh, myself and my co-author in the House, Representative Zach Stevenson, have introduced the Abortion Coverage Act. Because we also believe that people should be able to use the health insurance that they are paying for. The bill is very simple. I require that health plans cover abortion care should someone need that care. The fact that some plans cover abortion services and some don't is part of a pattern of discrimination and politicizing of health care that Minnesotans have said loud and clear that they will not tolerate. Maternity care, prenatal care, and primary care are already covered. Abortion services fall squarely into these categories, but are specifically carved out. So the bill is not a new requirement. It simply removes the carve out so that people can choose to use the health care that they are already paying for. It's not right to have people pay premiums all year round for a service that they cannot access because of politics. And of course, as with many laws that we have in the books, the current inability to access reproductive health care disproportionately impacts women, and specifically women of color. So it is not right, and we plan to make it right. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jill Collins, and I am a health educator, a patient advocate, and I am the co-chair of the Reproductive Health Alliance. 
The Reproductive Health Alliance is a consortium of reproductive and sexual health providers, leaders, and advocates from across the state whose mission is to guarantee access to sexual and reproductive health ser healthcare services in Minnesota. RHA member clinics provide vital healthcare services to tens of thousands of low income or uninsured folks and families across Minnesota. We are very grateful for the work done by the legislature in the 2023 session as an additional $6.3 million was appropriated for sexual and reproductive health care. The increase in this funding was meaningful to many of our clinics and has impacted school-based clinic expansion and the ability to provide evidence-based, medically accurate educational programming in K-12 Minnesota schools, testing, treating, and preventing sexually transmitted infections and diseases. In 2023, we saw a 25% increase in syphilis and a 42% increase in congenital syphilis cases. Syphilis has risen 244% over the past decade in Minnesota. This additional funding will help to increase our outreach efforts and address disparities. The increase in funding has also impacted our members' abilities to provide more long-acting reversible contraceptives and emergency contraception for a reduced cost center the patient's full range of choices for their sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion care, fill the gap for culturally inclusive care, and compete in the health care market and be able to compensate their staff fairly. Our strategic focus for the current and future legislative sessions includes, but is not limited to, supporting House File 3682 and efforts that support the implementation of health education standards, informing legislators of the impact and importance of 340B drug pricing to our organizations and our communities, elevating the need to increase workforce capacity in reproductive and sexual health care, including gender affirming care and continuing to advocate for comprehensive reproductive and sexual health services that include abortion care. The Reproductive Health Alliance believes in a future where all Minnesotans have access to reproductive and sexual health care and education. We are excited about the upcoming legislative session and opportunities to focus our efforts on other areas that are important to our work alongside the representatives and senators of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus. We will continue to advocate for legislation that supports all aspects of reproductive justice. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Senator Lindsay Port. I represent District 55, which covers Burnsville and Savage. I am the Senate Chair of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus. From the moment we started building the idea of this caucus in 2021, to the 2022 Dobbs decision that shattered protections and rights for half the population, to the escalating, dangerous, and too often fatal attacks on our trans, two-spirit, and non-binary family, the Reproductive Freedom Caucus has always understood that we must stand together in order to fight for our right to exist, love, and parent how we choose. It is an honor of my career to help lead this caucus, not because it's a glamorous position, but because the members and partners of the RFC embody solidarity, compassion, and unwavering clarity of purpose. Until we have reproductive freedom and bodily autonomy for all, we do not have reproductive freedom. Until every person who seeks abortion or gender affirming care can access it in their communities and can afford the care, we do not have reproductive freedom. Until providers have the tools and resources they need to provide the full spectrum of reproductive care to our entire state, we do not have reproductive freedom. Our caucus is 88 members strong, and our coalition spans dozens of organizations. The strong relationship between our members and partners led to the incredible progress that we achieved last year. We remain laser focused on the understanding that without bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom, we are not free to live our lives as our full selves. The Reproductive Freedom Caucus is committed to full reproductive and gender freedom and bodily autonomy for all. Affordable and accessible care in our communities, protected 
and supported providers and advancing healthy families, reproductive health, equity, and justice. We all deserve full reproductive freedom and our work will continue until that is a reality for all Minnesotans. We have an opportunity in Minnesota to continue to be a beacon of hope and safety in an increasingly dangerous and uncertain world. We can lead the nation by showing that providing gender and reproductive freedom is not just possible, but can be done with compassion, care, and joy. It is our deep honor to stand together as a Reproductive Freedom Caucus and share our agenda and commitment with the people of Minnesota. Thank you. We can now take a few questions. How is that process going to look? Um, will it start in the Senate? Um, so I'm the chief author on the House side for the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. So the Senate did pass uh, the, uh, their version that Senate filed last year. The House has uh, been working on language. We are looking to pass it this year and then send it over to the Senate. And hopefully uh, we have, uh, we've been working on ensuring that they can uh, accept what we send over. But, they, but what they did last year, the more because the language is different, they would have to vote on the new language, correct? So I think the plan is to amend what we passed last year, and then we would concur in the Senate. Okay. Do you have a timing? You just have to do it before the end of regular session, correct? Um, we have timing, but right now there's a lot of moving pieces, and so I think it would be better just not to put a timing out there in case there are changes, in which there will be changes that will be coming. So. Other than you do need to do it within regular session. Yes, and we have a plan, and it, it will. Uh, I'm 100% confident it will get done earlier in session than in later in session. How much money um, would that trans health care program for youth, how much money are you requesting? Sure. Um, yeah, we're currently um, requesting $1 million to be given in grants, although I would just having a conversation about where we can find more because the need is much greater. <laughs> so, um, health insurance that covers obviously maternity care, OBGYN, those are mandatory coverage periods. Do some policies, meaning, might I have a policy that covers abortion care? So right now, uh, Minnesota Care and MA does cover abortion care, but we are one of a handful of states that have no plans on Minsure or on their state um, uh, exchange. exchange that offers abortion care. Okay, so this would put that into the list of mandatory coverages? Correct. For all of the things that you just mentioned? So all of the things are already in there, it's just... No, we're I mean all of the uh, insurance policies, Minsure, uh, the... Uh, so all of the plans on Minsure right now, yes. Okay. None so of them cover abortion. insurance, would it be a, meaning employer-provided insurance, it would be a mandatory coverage? So correct? if it's an ERISA-based insurance, we have no say over that. Yeah. Would there be any cost if public plans already cover this, or do you know if there's like cost? We don't, don't, we are waiting for that fiscal note, so in that report, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> RFC members, meet on the stairs on the way to the Senate chamber. We'll take a group photo.